thing in good. There we go. We've got to start recording this. This will be available on our Think Lab YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to keep my introduction uh, as short as possible. Also, mentioning a few things. We're going to have a lot to cover today. So, welcome everyone for joining. Um, I'm Tyler Shores. I run the Think Lab for the University of Cambridge. Uh, we're here with Professor Inga Newburn through the magic of hybrid technology. Where um, I don't know how you can see me, but I can't see uh, it all yeah. There. Anyway, we're, <laughs> so we're all here together. We're at the old schools in the council room. Um, but uh, a little bit about what's brought us here today. So Inga is our first ever Think Lab visiting research fellow in residence, and also a fellow at Wilson College here at Cambridge. Um, in her uh, her day job, her normal gig, Inga is director of researcher development at the Australian National University, where she oversees professional development workshops programs for all. All ANU researchers. Aside from creating new blog posts on the Thesis Whisperer blog, she regularly writes uh, scholarly papers, books, books, chapters about research education with a special interest in post PhD employability. She's the co creator of the brilliant Post Act app, which you can look up, look up Thesis Whisperer Post Act to see a little bit about the, uh, the job research tool, the, the Post Act job research tool. And she co hosts a podcast called On the Reg with Jason Downs. Uh, Inga is the thesis whisperer on all the major social media platforms, although only on Twitter for a limited time until... 13th of August, I'm out. Yeah. So get her while you can, but she's on the threads and the mastodons and... Uh, and everywhere else. Yeah, she's everywhere. LinkedIn, uh, also on, on LinkedIn. And since this is her last uh, official uh, event with Cambridge, if I can digress for my prepared comments to also add um, that... Inga is without a doubt one of the most inspiring, generous, genuine people I've ever had the good fortune to meet during my time at Cambridge. And she doesn't even go here. She's not even here, other than when she's doing uh, things, cool stuff, Think Lab and Wilson things. So it's a thrill and honor to have you here one more time for now, uh, your last Cambridge event during this day. So everyone, please join me in giving Inga a nice uh, Cambridge welcome, and then we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Damn. All right, so this is the first time I've run this blended, um, and it's also I've added heaps more content because it's an hour longer than last time we ran it here at Cambridge, which was in Wolfson in June. Uh, so you know how they say you should never cook a new dish before a dinner party? <laughs> Bear with me, colleagues. I've cooked up a storm here. Um, I'm also uh, navigating quite a pokey screen and a cacophonous room. So, look, let's just um, do what we can. The link to the presentation is there on the slide deck. You can type that in if you're in the room and you want a closer up version of it. If you're online, um, you can also just type that in and find it. I put it in the chat earlier on, but if you've joined since then, you won't see it. So type in the link tree link. It's the top link. Could I ask that you mute if you're online? If you're online, you're probably going to see me not looking at you. I'm looking at you for a moment, but I'm mostly going to look over the top of you. And it's the worst angle for my chin ever. So thank you for bearing with that. Um, and so we'll only have the video up for a short amount of time. Everything that looks like a link in this slide deck is a link. Um, this slide deck will stay here for a month. Um, then I'll probably move it. You should be able to download it and um, all this sort of material is always available through the Thesis Whisperer website on the workshop page. So, okay, so I'm thrilled that we're here. We've got 33 people online and we've got, I don't know how many people in the room, but it's good to see you all. And I recognise some of you from our writing workshop. Um, we are all exhausted, aren't we, writing workshop people? I don't know about you, but I'm absolutely exhausted. We smashed it out for two days about how to write faster. During that workshop, I kept saying, of course, the secret to writing faster is to take better notes the secret to writing faster is to know where your notes are the secret to writing faster is to have a system for your notes so now I have to deliver on all those promises um, so I will do my very best it's a very complicated area of academic practice it just doesn't get talked about very much so um, with that in mind um, I would like you to talk amongst yourselves and feel free to mute um, the sound online if it gets too noisy coming through um, in, in the chat, I would like you to talk about this. I would like to place yourself on the axis of organisation. Where are you on the spectrum of how much you like to be organised? Are you Lady Gaga? I think we can see Lady Gaga. It's pretty free and easy and she's having a really fun time. I'm pretty sure Lady Gaga doesn't know where her files are most of the time, but she's making beautiful music. 
We've got Jared Leto in the middle there. He's trying to have a bit of both worlds. He's business casual, but blue velvet. That's a Jared Leto world. And then Adam Driver, he's very conventional. I imagine he knows where every file is and they're all named correctly with the right dates. I would like you to talk to the person next to you if you're in the room or just in the chat. What's your reaction to this? Where do you sit on the spectrum? Do you decide that you're actually all three and sometimes have different split personalities or do you tend to sit one area more than the other? So the question is, where are you on the spectrum of, uh, of being organised? Go. I'll give you five minutes. Is this your right? Hmm? Is this yours? Yeah, I think okay. so. Do you think it's fair, like from Tiago Ports' uh, blog post? I was like, this is a, a good like rundown version that's not like. I would share a couple of things that I like, like you know. Why don't you pop those in the chat as we go? That would be really, really good value. He's got good, um, uh, like his own workshop on like notes stuff. Uh, oh yeah, I would recommend. Yeah. I'd love to take it. It's just the time frame. I know. Never been right for me. Yeah, I'll share a few things. I'll just kind of be like the, you know, the second person in the announcing booth. If you say something, I'll be like, that's okay. yeah. There's another thing that we could share with Ruby. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Rihanna. I know my friend Russell and Finsley is here. She must be up late. Oh, no. It's the people you'd like to be. I'd like to meet already. Yeah. She has the right vibe. Lumina is very like, let's do this. Let's think about this. Yeah. 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 in the chat. That's good. I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah. Good start, good energy for yeah. Thursday in the afternoon. Well, no, I just I'm going to use this one or not. It does everything. It does. And it's still like, you know, everyone can relate in one way or another. Yeah. It never doesn't apply. <laughs> Yeah, I've been thinking about it since the first time I saw this. Is like it kind of depends on the context. And some things like Pink Five stuff, a little more Adam Driver, and then PhD and things, a little more Lady Gaga. Like it depends. It depends on the work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And at some point tonight, I should get the keys from you. It's like they're all her uh, tomorrow morning at her place. No, no, they just got picked up. Oh, oh okay. Never mind that. Yeah, you're off the okay. hook. Well, then I'll go. Is he coming to the library? Yeah, great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. So excited about that. Good. Okay. I'm glad that works out. Yeah, yeah. No, he just texted me then. So I told him to come in whenever he wants and we'll let ah, him in. Yeah. yeah.
funnily enough, so before you got to the old schools, um, I didn't want to repaint, of course, the last week. So I was kind of lazily opening and closing doors and stomping around just to be like, I'm here by the way, just so you know. It's a little childish, but I think I got my point across. So that guy's name is little weird. Did he? Yeah, he, he scented your territory. <laughs> I try not to stoop to their level, but... Tell them a minute left. Sorry, what was that? One minute left. Okay. Actually, I found some other books that I just put under my desk from the publisher stuff. So, oh, okay, we can put those out. Yeah, yeah, great. Leave them on the table so we don't forget. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I just buried amongst everything else. And I yeah, big cool. Um, yeah. Okay. I might just take your temperature, show of hands for Adam Driver. Show of hands for Lady Gaga. Welcome. Uh, any Jared Letos? Yep. Who feels that they move between them? Depending on what role you're taking. Yeah. It's often dependent on the role in your life. Sometimes we're more organized in some areas than others. I was right on top of my kids' medication schedules, his school schedules, his signing, his uh, excursion forms. I would not say that I had the same level of organisation around my grant funding because I just didn't care as much. So the more you care, sometimes, the more you tend to be organised. And organisation means different things to different people. Um, what we're here to talk about today is the organisation you need to produce a large writing project. That can be a book. It can be a PhD thesis. It can be an ongoing teaching commitment. It's all about how do you manage all the stuff, the information that comes at you from all angles and that you seek out yourself. How do you manage that stuff and make it available and accessible? Um, I keep thinking the forward arrow is going to work and it doesn't. Um, because our brains, quite frankly, aren't very good at this. Your mind, as David Allen says, is for having ideas, not for holding them. I mean, you'll know this if someone says something to you when you're in a hurry about a date or a time that you've got to remember, and you will probably forget that as the next thing comes on and takes its place and takes its place. And we've got really pretty good long-term memories. We've got pretty good short-term memories, but our brain doesn't work like a computer. Um, so in this workshop, we're really just going to share ideas about how to make things useful. Well, I'm going to share ideas with you and hopefully you'll share some ideas back with me as well. And we're going to talk more in the second half about systems. There's one thing to collect and write notes and there's another thing to find them again. So that's broadly speaking how I'm going to um, split the workshop up. Now, um, it, it takes inspiration from the title of this book, you know, and it does, I must say, when I say building a second brain instantly, the number of people who come along to the, what is essentially the same content has tripled or quadrupled. So I have to thank Tiago Forte for that and acknowledge that I stole the title a bit. Um, it is a great title because that's all what we want. We want an, another brain that's going to help us remember the things that we need to remember. Um, I found this book really inspiring and enlightening. I think one of the things about Tiago Forte's work is that his father was an artist and Tiago Forte is a, a knowledge worker and he really blends that kind of understanding of the problem of being a creative person and also having to produce things on demand and for audiences. So he has got a big website. Tyler's going to share some of the, uh, the links for that in the chat. Hopefully we'll compile them when we finish yes. up and we'll yeah. send you a, a wrap-up email. But do check them out. He also runs online courses. I don't know how good they are. I hear good things, but I haven't taken one myself. So if you're interested to explore more of this area, he runs online courses. And so there are courses called Linking Your Thinking as well. What I've tried to do is take what I've read in this area, plus my own academic experience from working with um, PhD students and early career researchers for nearly 20 years, I've tried to blend those two because while I think Tiago Forte's book is amazing, um, like any book of its sort, it can't really get down to that practical meat on the bones, pen to the paper, fingers to the keyboard level. So I'm trying to bridge that gap here. I'm going to end up in a 
confusing place, fair warning. So a lot of teaching, sometimes the point of it is actually to unsettle and disturb um, normal ways of doing things. Those of you who've been on my writing workshop for the last two days, I'm seeing some nods, um, will, can relate to what I say when I say unsettle and disturb. And that's the point of coming and learning something new. I'm not just going to confirm your previous biases. I'm going to throw a bunch of ideas at you. Again, you're all adults. You can decide how much of that you want to take on board. You can explore what I've got to offer. Um, you can start to use what I offer as jumping off points to make what's best for you. I think the problem with productivity books, and I love them, and if I'm in an airport, I have to buy them. Like, who is in with me with that? Hands up. Yeah, online, you can own that up in the chat. If you were a compulsive productivity book buyer in the airport, I witness you. Um, and the promise of them is really that somehow this book is going to solve every problem you've got. Um, they don't. Even this book, which is one of the best I've ever read, doesn't solve every problem you've got. So what I'm trying to introduce you to is range of techniques. Bring this book to a really academic focus and then open up the conversation about how we can make better um, note-taking systems for ourselves because this is our lived reality as researchers and academics. Um, there is just so much stuff. There's been a lot of pressure to publish especially in the last 20 years. And our academics have responded to that call in massive droves. So that means that the literature on pretty much anything is vast and ever expanding, incredibly difficult sometimes to keep up with. And I do feel like this man on the surfboard that one day the wave's going to break over my head and I won't know what's up or down. Um, who feels a little overwhelmed by the literature? Yes, that's why we are all here. So Surfing the wave is probably the best we can do. We need a good surfboard. We need some technique. And that's what we're going to work on today. Now, one of the things I like about Tiago Forte's book is I think that he describes the problem really well. And I'll let you read that for yourselves for a moment. So this little piece, this little excerpt is where he's comparing the purpose of taking notes where you were taught to take notes in school. The purpose of note taking then was to take an exam and to remember usually facts, okay? We've got a different problem with our note taking as professionals. Um, it's not at all clear what deserves the note or not. And making decisions about that can sometimes be difficult. In a PhD thesis, that decision's made for you a bit by the topic, but not totally because there's many areas of literature that can impinge on the topic. Um, when and how the notes will be used. In a big writing project, you assume the notes are going to be used in a book, but if you think about it as a working academic particularly, they will also be used for teaching and they will also be used for um, other purposes like presentations. So notes don't always just end up in a long form piece of writing. They can end up in any place at any time in any form. So someone might call you up or you might be sent an email asking a question, how, you know, how do I understand this? Or do you know something about this? Your expertise is X. I would like to know your view on why. And you think, oh, I've read a paper somewhere. I know I could add to that question. Oh, it's back in somewhere. Ooh. Um, so you can also just be asked to recall facts. And this can happen not just in your email correspondence in the morning. It can also happen in meetings, in committees, in front of your boss at any time. So having ready access to, um, to detailed information is part of our jobs as academics. Um, and you're allowed to look at them anytime. And in an exam context, you're not allowed to look at your notes, but your notes can be looked at anytime you want. So if they're really long, sometimes that's not helpful because you just need to get to the facts. So highlighting and bolding, and we'll get to all that sort of stuff can be really helpful for, um, for referencing your notes on the run, um, through your phone perhaps, um, it, your computer equipment might not be, your full computer equipment might not be with you. So there's a lot of contingencies there. And you expect to to take action on your notes. You're not expected just to regurgitate the facts. You're meant to use them to do something, which means that the note-taking process, or as I prefer to call it, note writing, is actually a creative transformation process as much as anything else. But then when we are doing that, we need to be aware of things like ethics and plagiarism 
and be careful that we don't accidentally plagiarise um, other people's work. So we, we do as academics have to be quite particular about how we store the notes and how we make sure we know what ideas and words are other people's and which are ours. And as the project gets bigger and bigger, that gets harder and harder. Reaction, thought, feel, opinions. You can just type it in the chat. Questions. My teacher silence not working. Did I just nail it completely? And you're just like, <laughs> yes, I'm here. I'm on board. Inga, you've just described my life. Okay, that's that's rare, uh, but sometimes I do nail it. Okay. Um, one of the concepts, first of all, let's do an exercise just to get started with thinking about this. So what sort of notes should you collect? Um, I really like this uh, Feynman's 12 problems method that Tiago Forte talks about. So just to quote him, you have to keep a dozen of your favourite problems constantly present in your mind, although by and large they will lay in a dormant state. Every time you hear or read a new trick or new result, test it against one of your 12 problems to see whether it helps. Every once in a while, there'll be a hit and people will say, how did he do it? He must be a genius. Now, this is Richard Feynman, very famous uh, physicist, uh, played the bongos. My brain remembers that because brains are relational, right? Brains remember things through similarities, feelings through weird association. I've never heard of another physicist playing the bongos. So I do remember Feynman as a bongo playing phys physicist. His wife had tuberculosis. My brain also offers that to me. He was, did he prize? Am I right about that? My brain is less concerned with that, right? So my brain remembers weird things because everyone's unique and we all have different, we are all got our own neurotypes. And of course, some of us are neurodivergent and our memories will work quite differently. Um, and some of us, like myself, I just test quite on the border of the autistic spectrum, but I don't tip over. And so I have a different type of memory to someone who doesn't have um, such a high level of um, autistic traits. Does that make sense? All right. So we need to take into account that we're all wonderfully diverse. And so what we need as people is going to be different. But I think these 12 problems actually really help us as writers and creators. Here are some of mine. Um, academic work, slow and hard. I find it slow and hard. I just always after something that makes it easier and faster. Um, I work and I get very upset about the commercialization of our academic databases, um, corporatization of profits, people putting their hand in the public purse, paywalls, access to um, research in the global south, it makes me mad. That second question comes out of that, how do I make research findings and ideas more accessible? How do I help other people do that? My latest book, be Visible or Vanish is all about that continuous obsession with that question. So my, as I go around and, you know, things appear on Twitter and Mastodon, someone sends me a paper, I read a paper, there's a link to something else. This question is lurking in my mind. That bunch of feelings is working in my mind and I'll see something and I'll just grab it and I'll grab it and I'll grab it and I'll grab it and eventually I've got enough to make a book right? So you'll be all doing similar things, similarly to those other questions, but I also have non-academic interests. I love reading romance books. Anyone going to join me? Thank you, colleague. Okay. okay. So I'd love to write one one day. That's a challenge for me. And also I just, no one's written one. I really, really, really want to read yet. So I figure I maybe have to write that for myself. All right. So I would like to know how to write fiction. I'm really interested in fiction. I'm an avid reader. Reading about how people write actually increases my enjoyment of fiction. Did I mention that I test heightened autism? <laughs> uh, I have a special interest around it. I think you kind of can't be an academic without an inclination to special interest in some way. So um, I'd like to eventually write it. So whenever I see someone write something useful about that or I see a book, I grab it. And I'm really passionate about the environment. You'll note the sticker on my computer, which the rest of you can't see. The Greens are very different in Australia because we actually can get into government. It's <laughs> a whole other thing. We're not ruining the chances for the left to get into power. Um, so I door knock for the Greens 
at, I work for the Greens. I do policy work for the Greens on the weekend. It's my seventh job. Okay. Um, and I'm really, I've become very interested in those kind of conversations that you have on doorstops and how to persuade people that neatly feed, sort of feed, fed back into how do I make research finding and ideas more accessible? Because that's also about teaching academics what persuasion means, what bias means, what misinformation means. So they all kind of work together. So by actually declaring, and I don't have 12 problems, I don't think I need 12. Feynman probably just pulled that number out of his backside because he was playing the bongos and they said, how many questions? He said, 12. Um, I don't think you need 12, but I would like you to sit down and I would like to give, you know, 10, let's say 10 minutes to having a go. If you had to express the things that govern you, some of those questions will be coming out of your PhD, but not all of them. I'd like to see if you can express them it's simply like I have here. 10 minutes. If you're at home um, or um, just studying online, just um, write them down on a piece of paper. This is a self-directed activity, 10 minutes. Let's give everyone tip, tips online as they come up. So, All right, yeah, fantastic. It's a real value add experience. I'm hungry, I didn't eat one. Oh no. Is it bad that someone else has sandwich? <laughs> Would you like to take a break at some point? I could get me something. Yeah, I'm not like super hungry yet. Okay. And I'm probably going to forget about it as I teach. No, it's like when I stop, then I thought, I'm quite hungry. What are you in the mood for? I got to stay the sandwich. Okay. I think I can get out. I can be out because we're right across from Marsha's place. I can be back in I think time. we'll take a break. Okay. I can do it. I can get something quick. Thank you. I should have just thought, but I was too busy talking to so. Uh huh. Hey, haircut. Something looks different. No, I just washed it. Uh, <laughs> something was different. <laughs> I washed and brushed it. You're not used to seeing me like that. Needs a cut though. It's been three months. As a guy, you have to give me some credit. It's like, I noticed. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Appreciate that, Colin. Getting some real like powerful regrowth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. One day I'll just go grey and be grey, but I have a little bit on one side of my head. You're not grey. To so that I say cup of fire. <laughs> so it hasn't gone off yet. It hasn't. We'll be weirdly recorded here, you realize in the People will just listen to our commentary. <laughs> I encourage you to make it as simple as possible. Explain it to an eight-year-old simple. Phone charging for. Yeah. iPhone one, right? Yeah.
So about four and a half minutes. I suggest you have a look at them and see if you can collapse any of them into the same thing. Sometimes we circle around the same problem. And is there a bigger category, you know, that it can describe it more simply? Four more minutes. Mm -hmm. Got about a minute left. Okay. Did anyone notice anything about that activity that they want to share? Yeah. Yeah, so not, it's nice to bring your whole self to this. Yeah, yeah, because the the note taking problem is bigger than the than the writing. Yeah, absolutely, and we are very well rounded people. Any any other reactions? Anything online that you'd like to read out? I like uh, what Catherine said here: deep thinking and engagement to place via historical research a way to share research with public to lead to environmental caring. A lot that covers a lot. Is that one one sentence? <laughs> two, two. Okay, yeah. two yeah. sentences that covers yeah. everything. Yeah, and so I, what I like about that too is it shows us too we have feelings about things, right? We have emotions. 
and 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 we're often encouraged as academics to leave them to one side but actually um, when you're passionate about something um, that can actually be really helpful in terms of memory and noticing it's actually okay just making it okay in my roller's thesis whisperer to make things okay yes as far as I can, I as far as I can. Um, all right, so I'm really interested now in what you're actually doing at the moment. Um, so we'll just have a little five minute chat because otherwise it gets me talking all the time and it's a bit dull. Um, five minutes, can we make breakout rooms? Yep. Of groups of four. Let's see. Um, actually, I might give you 10. I would like you to talk small groups with each other about what are you actually doing at the moment? Um, and particularly, I'd like you to notice someone saying something, you go, oh, that's cool, um, because I'll be asking you, what did you hear that was cool? All right. So off you go. Three is a nice group. Yeah. Okay. Online people, I'm just going to hit the button. We're all going to uh, do groups. So it's going to be automatic. So good luck starting now. I am not going to break out room. Remember Evernote? You were big Evernote person, right? I was, yeah. yeah but they're shedding stuff. Yeah. They've been sold to an Italian company. I didn't even, so I can't remember if I told you when I did work at Stanford, I lived right next to the um, Evernote headquarters. Uh, when I went back recently, I didn't see that building anymore. Yeah, they've so. moved to Europe. Oh, okay. Yeah, they've closed their American. Um, that was cool, though, to be like, oh, that's so good. I know, I think, yeah. And they were really explicitly always said that they were going to be, we're here forever. Hence, ever know. And you can trust them. Great product. Mm -hmm. But I took everything out. I did too. Yeah. It took a while though. I kind of I was know. like back and forth and oh I was God. like, oh, I'm going to migrate. And it's like, the other stuff isn't that good. Let me try it again. I was like, oh, I added so much crap to it. It's like the Microsoft wordification of things. I really cleaned house when I took it out too. Like, you know, I don't want that, but I don't want that. Yeah. That's where the 12 questions actually really helped. I'm like, I'm not interested in that anymore. Feel free to let it go, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm really, I didn't want to be in the situation where I had to keep paying to access my thoughts. Yeah. I picked up Rome briefly because Mark Carrigan said it was good. Me too. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to have to keep paying to see my thoughts. Um, what was I going to say? So uh, I'm sitting visiting about. Mark and I talked about Ulysses, you know, that um, yeah. kind of plain text editor thing? Because I bought it originally. And then me, like a lot of people, just when they were like, oh, we're going to switch to a different model. It's like, but I bought it and like I'm supposed to own it. And they're like, oh, now it's just a rental license thing. I was like, no. Yeah, I resent that. I think he still uses it, but I just resent him. Yeah, I think he like, had so much in there. No take backs. I don't yeah, like that. No, I don't like it either. I, I mean, Obsidian could well do that. The difference with Obsidian is every file is just a text file and it's in Markdown. Yeah. So I've still got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the connections and stuff might be harder to. That's why I kind of say. But I'm not so fussed about that. I mean, it's happened before, but I kind of feel like Obsidian feels the most future proof, hopefully. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. I've been burned enough that I'm kind of like, all right, now I know what I don't want to have now. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually really like Markdown as a format. Like, it took me a while. Me too. Now, now I was like, I, I don't like understand that. what this is. Now the like the simplicity just sort of like it's just the word. That's all it is. And I was like, yeah, I actually prefer this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's definitely a thing. Undergrad, I totally used to be the like the font and the size and kind of thing. And then at some point, it was just like, nope, it doesn't matter. All I care about is like the words themselves. That was a very tremendously freeing thing about being an architect. It just, it just didn't, it didn't take note. Mm. We didn't have exams. Everything is project based. Oh, okay. And performance done, based. Like sketches or things? Yeah. Or, yeah okay. I mean, you keep some of that, uh -huh. throw the rest out. Huh. We had photocopies of buildings, like I had like then, but I'd often just throw them out, like when I was done. Like that. Out of curiosity, and again, this is like this research remote for me. If you were an architect now, do you think you'd send your everything by hand, pencil, and paper? Or would you no, like I never did it by hand. Okay. I taught, was taught by hand, but okay. I the computer came in when I was in third year, and I just went fully into that. And that's how I started teaching. Oh. So I didn't have anyone to teach architecture uh -huh. computing because none of the staff knew. Yeah, so no, I was still an undergraduate like, when I started teaching. 94. 90s? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
they were just like, we need all these people. And so I taught. Mate, I I did not. Yeah. I went into architecture firms. I got exploited. And then I met Luke and he's sort of like, this seems very exploitative to me. I and think then, you said yesterday. It was yeah. More... And then I went to double my salary. Yeah. And then I fell out of love with architecture altogether. I didn't ever really like it, to be honest. Mm. I was studying it. It was great fun. Drawing is fantastic. Creating things. My my final year project was a big knitted building. All about knitting. Uh -huh. Huh. Don't know why. Huh. Interesting. And so, yeah, I was just very into geometry and shapes and you know aesthetics and is it good or bad that i liked uh the fountain a lot it's bad yeah yeah because yeah. I, I enjoyed it too but it's a problematic phase i know it's like so problematic it changed the way i looked at buildings and things i know and it did that for a lot of people yeah but i really wish you hadn't yeah i know I sometimes think i should write it it is a romance too yeah um it's just, it's terrible. Everything about it is terrible in terms of, and I knew that when I was making it. Yeah. Um, Every time there's a representation of architects on the screen or on the page, it's wrong and it hurts me. Uh -huh. And I just go, oh, I can't. Like, yeah. And Luke's the same with hackers. It's just like, ah, oh, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not things. how it works. Yeah. Pillars of the Earth is good. Have you read that one? The Sorry? Ken Follett, Pillars of the Earth. I love that. Yeah. That's probably the. Again, stupid, yeah. but a bit more rooted in how actually things happen. I really like I that. I quoted that in my thesis. Yeah. We went yeah. to, actually, part of the reason we went to Canterbury, right? Yeah, Canterbury, yeah. Uh, was because we both read that book, Julie, and I was like, oh, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I think that, that that really was the system of how you became an architect back then. Yeah. But, of course, you know, creatively, little bit. I just thought it was cool. It Everything was cool. About it, it was cool. fun. It was a yeah. great book. I yeah, love books. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I was expecting that. Actually. There was actually, yeah. Wow. I like Name of the Rose too oh, yes. by Umberto Eco, yes. one of my favorites because it's about library architecture and all, you know, that was labyrinth. Fun. And, Judith yeah. Butler, but she was still my undergrad mentor, told me to read that book. And I was Did like, she? yeah. I was like, Yes. It's a good sure. one. It is. It is really which good. is not something you say about his other books. Yeah. No, in post yeah. people, they kind of hate it. I tried. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much potential in books about architecture because they put you so solidly in a place and they're so, con you know, literally concrete. Like, because you have to describe scenes and stuff, they're very atmospheric books that are, you know, really center place. Of, and a lot of books just don't do that. You should do a modern version of that. Yeah, I know. Like, like the modern. fountainhead, a yeah. famous yeah. fountainhead. Yes. Yeah. Set it set in like 2023 or 2030 or whatever. That'd be super interesting, actually. It would actually. That would open our eyes to all of those different things. I'm a little Office triggered by like architecture offices. I, don't, I mean, so with such a sexist profession, I don't can't even begin to tell you the experiences that I used to have there. Give them a two minute warning. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Some people just not joining. Yeah. I mean, some are probably here, so that might have something to do with that. Did you share the link out? I did. Why well, I, I assigned them automatically, so. Most people are in rooms, but a couple aren't. I don't know the Ricky room, probably because she's right here talking to the other folks. Yeah. Oh, well. So, I'm going to pull Matt in a minute. Maybe some sort of break within the next 
know. It doesn't feel like that long right now, but. How are we going to manage break? I don't know. That's going to be hard. I might have to give Brown my card again, and then she can just let people. Even that's that's not going to be great. I think we probably should do the next segment, yeah. which is a lot of me talking and then take a break. Yeah. Because I'll be wanting a break. Yeah. Okay. And that'll be an hour and a half. Yeah, that's a good idea. Though. All right. Do you want to give them that end? Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think they get the sixty seconds to come back out, mm -hmm. and if they're chatting. I might just get teleported back. Tell me when they're back. What I'll do is I'll get them to do an example and cross over that with the break. Because some people who want to do practice one of the note taking type or start setting up a note taking matrix or something. So we'll cross that over with a break of people who want to start okay. a break. And the good start. thing is, we do have some old school staff like Lucy here. So oh, they okay. can make a take and blow. Right. Okay. That's, that's fine. All right. They're back. Yep. Okay. I'm now, I'm now, I hate to break up the party. I always hate to break up the party, <laughs> but that is my role, party pooper chief. Um, I send this invitation to people on chat. Did you, in your groups, type something that you learned that was cool in the chat? We'll read it out. But I just throw the question to the room. Did anyone learn anything cool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you learned there was quite an intricate system going over here already. I'm not sure I can teach you anything, colleague, but it's good that you came. I do find that um, a lot of people who come here are already like into note taking. Has anyone put themselves in that category? Like I'm already really into it. I am. No. Um, yeah. So I don't want to say that your way is not as good as my way, just so we're clear on that. If it's working for you, that's all that matters. I'm very instrumental about it. Um, but it's great. Uh, so you found that having that conversation, did you learn things that you just thought, oh, I've never thought of that as a way of doing it? Is that... Yeah. And you raise a really important point. Like what we take, we think about notes traditionally as just taking notes about what other people have said. And what you're saying is you're taking notes about what you're thinking about the data, what things you're noticing, what things you need to remember. Um, and in qualitative note taking, um, sorry, qualitative analysis, who does qualitative, broadly speaking, interviews and things like that, um, we have a, a, an idea called memoing, right, where you put a, like equivalent of a sticky note on the data that captures a thought or an idea. I'm an I'm a absolute obsessive memo, memoer. <laughs> um, and uh, I export those memos into my database because they're my thoughts about what I think is happening here. So it is it is not just about other people's words. Um, it can be about images. 
It can be about manuscripts. These capturing your own thoughts are really important. So it's good to open that discussion up. Anyone else learn something cool? Yeah, I agree with you about this. I mean, we're talking about things and saying, like, you know, you're happy, you're Yeah. 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 So we are offered up these like proper ways of doing it. Yeah. And we measure ourselves against that. And anything that we don't do is deviant. Right. So there's a concept in sort of study steals education called um, legitimate academic deviance. And that means we all do it, but we don't talk about it because it's deviant behavior. And then when you have a conversation here amongst your peers, you go, oh, maybe I, maybe Maybe that's not just me. I don't have to go into a shame spiral or self-blame. I'm just doing what everyone else does, but no one's owning up to it. So many areas of life are explained by the concept of legitimate deviance. I can't even begin to, to name them. Okay, so. That's a good segue to some of the online comments. Yeah. Can I read a few of these? Yeah. Um, Note-taking is a very individual thing. What works for one doesn't necessarily work for others. Um, I learned that I'm not the only one who uses physical note-taking techniques, which is good, actually, because... Some a lot of research actually starting to show that physical note taking is better for our comprehension and memory learning abilities. And also when it comes to, I don't know, note taking or lecture and these sort of things, it makes sense, right? Because when we're trying to type in everything, we go into like court reporter stenographer mode, type, 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 type. Uh, when you're doing it by hand, like we can't write as fast as like one of us can talk. So it's like, wait, how do I summarize what Inga says? That kind of effort actually is really good for us. Like mm. we're building in kind of the connections within our brain. So that's a good thing. Mm. Uh, other people are into Obsidian. One of the takeaways was that we need a way to make our thinking visible and editable in a systematic way. I like that one. Yeah, that's I do like that. One. Yeah. And someone else really likes, uh, I'm not the only, I'm also into taking notes with fountain pen. I like fountain pens, but my hands get kind of sweaty sometimes and it smudges. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't like the expensive ones. Not good for left handers either, but if you can, I witness you. I think it's beautiful. It is. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so I think the key takeaway is, and this always, uh, I know I hear myself saying this over and over in classrooms, and I think it comes across as an excuse, but I don't mean it that way, in that we can offer up all sorts of ideas, but you really have to make it your own. And if anything I offer resonates with you straight away, try it. If things that I offer just seem a bit weird to you, still try it, right? Um, because sometimes we don't know. And don't just try it once and decide that it's terrible. Like, live with it, try it. We all have had the experience. Most of us here have probably been teachers as well. We've all had that experience where a student goes, oh, I, that didn't sound good, so I didn't try it. Or I tried it once, I didn't really dig into it. You really do have to, you know, um, to try things out seriously, not just sort of decide straight away that it's not for you. So I'm going to go into my next segment, which is basically a smorgasbord of techniques. I don't offer any of these as right or wrong, different tools, different purposes, different sort of people um, will find different um, takeaways. Here's the list. I've crossed out taking and put note writing methods. So I really, again, want to emphasize the message that, um, that note taking is actually the writing. That's the writing process. It's when it's starts. Um, sentence method is something I kind of made up. I, maybe that's my only contribution to the literature on note taking. I've not written it up anywhere. It's a really bad name. I can't think of a snappy name for it that will make me famous. I'm already a micro celebrity. I don't need that anyway, but um, sentence method, I'll explain that. Uh, Cornell method, which is one of those ones that you probably legitimately academically deviate from. Um, but I still want to talk about it. Sketch notes, diagramming, highlighting, note tables, margin meeting notes. And I've got the slip box in there, but actually I told you this was a dinner party where I was trying out new dishes. I've actually moved that to the second half, um, but I will get to the Zettel custom. Um, no note at the bottom. No method is perfect. You can take them. You can combine them. You are probably already doing that. In my explanation of them, we're probably just putting some words around your existing practices. 
The sentence method is simply that you write any reactions to the text you read, the video you're watching, the picture, you always include a verb. All right, so uh, Inga 2023 asserts that you should write notes with verbs that help you remember how you felt about that person's work. Why verbs? Because verbs in academic writing are really judgy. All right, what is the difference between someone who asserts and someone who argues? Would someone like to explain the difference to me? Online, you can have a go in the chat. What if I put argues there instead of asserts? What's the difference? Partly. Asserts doesn't give the other side. Yep. Assert is declarative and somehow preempts debate. Degree of certainty. Assertion is more forceful. Question mark. May not be evidence. Mm. Yes. Exactly. Thank you, online people. Assertion is, a for, if we look in the dictionary, simply assert means to sort of just make a claim and it can be a baseless claim. And we're pretty familiar with that in our political class, aren't we? Um, so if I say Mewburn asserts, I'm actually dragging Mewburn a bit, right? She's a bit shit. Because the Mewburn who argues is the Mewburn who has thought about through the evidence can back up what they say. They're just not saying it loudly and confidently. Verbs are really judgy. I once taught verb judginess out in Northern Territory and an Indigenous woman said to me, oh, I finally get it. I'm just meant to write like an uptight white person. I said, exactly. All right, upper middle class dinner party. That's the kind of tone. And so a lot of the verbs are coded in that way. And when we study it, Different academic groups have different dialects when it comes to verb and different verb preferences. Don't know if I put a slide there. Oh, I did. Thank you, Pastinger. Researchers use verbs in a couple of different ways, three primary ways. Research acts, cognition acts, discourse acts. So research acts are things you actually do. You're observing something. Are you distilling something? You're analyzing something. Explores a little bit on the edge case, but they're usually verbs that, re that refer to sort of concrete acts of doing. Cognitions are include uh, are really about thought processes. So believing something is different from disbelieving something, for instance, but belief, conceptualize, suspecting is different from believing, viewing something is a sort of standing back. So cognition acts have different types of flavor. And we also use verbs around discourse acts. So ascribe, discuss, they're about things that people have said. And to confuse you more, when people write, we treat them like they're saying something, not like it's written down. Make sense? So authors, academic authors use these verbs in these three different ways. If, if you want more about that, there's a link there to disciplinary discourses, social interactions and academic writing by Highland. Fantastic book. He's written about 14 books, mostly about verbs. I have them all. I've read them. You're welcome. I've just taken the bits that you need to know. All right. So suffice to say that um, different disciplines use different verbs. So for instance, scientists use lots of verbs, but they tend to use um, verbs about acts. Okay, philosophers use lots of verbs. They use lots of verbs about cognition acts rather than research real-world acts, okay? This really affects how people write. So philosophy, their favourite verbs are say, suggest, argue, claim, point out, propose versus physics, which is develop, report, study. So we can almost say that different academic disciplines have different dialects. That's how it's been described. And they reflect the way that knowledge is built. So humanities talk a lot more about discourse act verbs because we're a bit more interested with how people have said them and what they've said and what they think about things, whereas science tends to favour just what people have done. It's a lot more straightforward, actually, in science. The upshot of all this, though, is really that you just need to decide what your verbs, how your verbs are acting, what they mean. And for me, in my discipline, if I use argues, it means that I believe what that person said, or I think that person had valid reasons for saying it. If I put asserts in my notes, then that's a note to future self that I thought it was a bit crap. Basically, that's how I use it in a note taking. In writing, like come to another writing workshop, 
I could spend a day on verbs, but they are these evaluative verbs, they act as these subtexts. And so if you're acting as your own research assistant, a verb can do a lot of heavy lifting there. Also, if you write a sentence with a verb, that sentence tends to come out with the subject and object in it as well, strangely enough. And often those sentences can be just lifted up and placed. So the dream being that you're not double or triple handling your thoughts, you're writing them as a little thought nugget, as a sentence. Later on, you're finding them again. We'll talk about that at the end. And you're just putting them in your text. That's the dream. Now, I made the big claim during my workshop this week that that's just how I write. And it's true. That's just how I write. Um, and that part of that is just getting a handle on the verb. It's an amazingly simple trick. Any questions about, about verbs? Yep. So, so as the, the form of um, so, uh, yep. she's not knowing how, when, where, why, for whom, who, who, who is. And I think I'm just about to now, the first time, why is that question on um, side of the internet? I'm just surprised. I guess because I know you, um, if you want to talk about what you did, what piece of literature you're citing out of the same literature? So they thought that this out of the right so many things that is in the Yep. Um, so if you go in, you can find that one thing that's just about people saying, or if you're a piece of it, or if you're thinking about it, all the sentences, and you just all of them are a synonym, and you go in it, and you're not. Yeah, no, you raise a really important point. When you're early in a literature search, which I am in my neurodiversity project at the moment, it's much harder to write these kind of sentences and you have to write lots of them. That's just a price that I accept. And I just write, uh, can I just be Australian for a moment? A metric shit ton of them. Um, that also is a way of me coming to understand the material and coming to process it for myself. As the project tends to go on, I get much more strategic about it and I'll show you a method in the moment that makes it much more laser focus. I just want to offer this method, explain it at length because I really, it is a bit of a foundation coat to all the other things I'm going to talk about. Question up the back. <laughs> I teach across every discipline and people tell me it works in different places. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They found or they showed. It's a much more neutral verb and it's the important thing in science is not to be as judgy. There's less judginess in science. They tend to use the verbs that are more in those research acts that are a bit more neutral flavoured. In the humanities, we're much more judgy. It's a spectrum of judginess. Great. So that's, again, you've picked up on that culture in science that thinks reports is my equivalent of asserts. I didn't know that because I don't write in science. The general principle is that verbs will be loaded and coded. All right. Good. You didn't expect to come here and get nerded at about birds. I'm, does everyone understand it? Any questions online? No. Good. Good. We're all good. All right. Uh, I made a verb cheat sheet because I'm very practical and I forget things. So this is mine and there's a link there in the slide deck to, and you can download my template and make your own. So I put it into three um, categories. This work is awesome. I feel neutral. This work is poor. There is one word I think that's in both. That's just because I tend to be a bit sloppy like that. Um, this is, for me, it's a general kind of social science-ish, education-ish kind of template. Again, your mileage will vary considerably because you're coming from a different discipline. Um, the 
advantage of using a table like this is that it also gets you to just be a bit, use a bit more variety in your verbs. We all get a bit kind of verb dependent. It makes our writing a bit dull. Um, and so if you start to use more of these verbs in your notes, you can start to look up the table and think, how do I really feel about this? What is my critical assessment of it? And pick a verb that sort of fits. And also really think about the dictionary definition. There's a difference between something that illustrates and something that evaluates and something that demonstrates and something that identifies. These are all very particular types of words. If you're writing about someone's writing or someone's work, um, being very particular about those verbs is really helpful, okay? And it will make a difference too when it comes to your writing and how people receive your writing. So the pros of this method of trying to write in sentences with verbs, all you do is say this sentence has to have a verb. I'm going to write a sentence that has to have a verb. The pros is it helps you avoid plagiarism as well because you're always working at that remove. Rather than just copying what that person said, you're putting yourself in it and you're processing it from the start. It reduces that transaction cost of writing drafts. And the drawbacks, as you've already noted, um, creates a lot of material needs to be filed quite carefully though it doesn't get lost when you commit to a draft and we'll get to that at the end any questions okay so i if you're interested in that cheat sheet assess whether it works for you and you can just print it out i've seen it in offices all over the world which is really pleasing i've had this thing out here for 10 years or 11 years now um or make your own All right, for now, template method, which um, I've already pre-described as um, something that we have a legitimate academic deviance from. It's often um, given to people as an excellent way of um, keeping notes. It is, it's really amazing, but it's a lot of investment of time. This is how it works. Basically, the page is divided into three parts. We've got a column on the left-hand side where you put sort of keywords or themes and that's meant to act as a quick reference aid when you come back to it. Um, and in the right-hand column, you write quotes or you paraphrase using the sentence method that I just talked about. I'm going to call it the Mewburn method. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Using the Mewburn method, I'm trying that one out. Um, you can write the sentence method. So you can see why I present that first as a kind of base code. Um, and then this is a way to start to put that in a um, a more summary template way. At the bottom, you write a short summary. I find ChatGPT is really good at this and I use it in Obsidian to do that. So I'll write a lot of sentences in Obsidian. I've got a, and I'll show you at the end, the ChatGPT plugin that will summarize it all. Um, it creates great records. It's fantastic. Wish that I did it. I don't do it. It's time consuming. It's hard to manage the templates inside databases. It's fatiguing. It feels like a lot of work. You're not really sure where it's going. I'm impatient. I really witness and respect people who do use it. Is anyone a Cornell template person? Because immediately you go up 10 times in my estimation of your ability to stick with something. My co-writer, Catherine Firth, is a big fan and uses it. And I respect Catherine enormously. It says something about you as a person, if you can do this, that's complimentary. Most of us, though, can't. When is it best used? It's best used at the start of a project, I think, um, because it creates really good comprehensive records you can come back to. Towards the end of a project, I think it's a bit too laborious. So it's more for when you're scanning the whole horizon of literature and trying to work out where you sit, where the problem space is and so on. Any questions about Cornell template? There's a link there. There's plenty of versions of them online. Has anyone from um, Zoom offered up a Cornell template? No, thought? but one person uh, recommended Academic Phrase Bank. So the Academic Phrase Bank, bank. Yes. 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 Highly recommended. Yes. Sketch notes. Um, this is an example of a sketch note I found in line. One of the things that for talks about in his book is that our brains have really highly developed visual systems. We're really attuned to finding objects in space and to seeing patterns visually. So producing drawings actually mobilizes that kind of visual cortex. It helps us, really helps us make sense of information. Indigenous knowledge systems leveraged this to great effect for tens of thousands of years um, was visual systems to remember things, um, certain trees, certain rocks, certain land 
platforms had stories and songs that went with them, helped them remember things like climate information, hunting information, um, who lived and died there, et cetera. All right, so they're amazingly powerful methods. However, and also I think fun, they're a good excuse to buy coloured pencils. And who doesn't love a coloured pencil, honestly? And stickers. Bloody love a sticker. But you've always got stickers. You're like, what do I do with the stickers? You write your notes, you put your stickers on them. If you want to keep them digitally, it's okay. You can take a, a photo with your phone and you can file them. Like they're, they're, you, this, you can bridge the kind of digital drawing divide. You can draw online for that matter. Um, there are drawbacks. It takes up space. It's hard to search them sometimes, um, depending on whether you've got a system that's got optical character recognition that can recognise something inside a drawing. And it's also challenging if you do, don't self-identify as being talented as drawer. Who feels that they've got drawing talent? Great, yeah. I've got three degrees in architecture. I can draw like a dream. All right, so um, I like sketch notes. I don't do them like this, where they're that particular type of stylistic, almost cartoony way. That's beyond me. But drawing little pictures, and I think some of you who were at the writing workshop will have my pictures in your or sketchbooks already, I draw pictures um, and they really help me. So I just want to say that's a really legitimate way of keeping notes. And sometimes can also, if you've got that critical analysis, you really hate something. Um, when I used to annotate the side of printed out um, PDFs, who still does that? It's okay, I'm not judging, but maybe it's not really the most super effective way. But I used to love to annotate the side of PDFs because I'd draw things and I'd draw exclamation marks and I'd put explosions and things about things that I didn't like or did like. When I was coming back over those, those um, physical pieces of paper, my eye, I was instantly drawn to where I'd drawn a picture of a feeling or a, a reaction and it was... A, a really good, really effective way to go straight to the bit that's really important in the note. So you might say write notes by hand and draw over the top of them. These things again can be blended. Any questions or comments about sketch notes? Question online yep. and then Nosley, did I see your hand raised for a second? Did you want to add something? Sorry. Yes, Snail? In line online? Uh yeah. So one is uh any advice uh for organizing paper sketches, which you talked about just a little bit. Um it's helpful to keep them in a journal. I'm going to talk about the bullet journal. Um, it's helpful to keep a bullet journal because it indexes them. Um, the other thing I would add, so like for people online that have seen the chat, so remember when I said um, uh, Apple Photos, uh, using that for OCR, the search is really good. Yeah, the I've search never is done it, right. but seriously. So like Apple yeah. phone, uh, I type in tacos. Oh my gosh, 12 results for tacos. Like that doesn't surprise me knowing you talk. Only 12. But and like you well. can you can do this with paper notes too. So like a little bit hit or miss on that. But like any photos that are in your um, th right now, this is just an Apple thing. Uh, Google Keep is pretty good, but in my opinion, Apple is like scary good. And you can also type. Thing. I can type koala and find the picture of the sleepy koala that calms me. Um, so it can also recognize things. It's scary good. Yeah, it's surprisingly mm -hmm. good. So that's one yeah. way to answer your question about like how to organize it. You could digitize those and then search. A little bit hit or miss depending on how like definite the images are, but it's something to at least try. Search yeah. has gotten so good with visual things. It's kind of crazy. It is really good. So the bridging this sort of digital hand divide is easier than it's ever been. Questions in the room? Thoughts or feel opinions? Their opinions that have feelings with them, thoughts or feel opinions. No, okay. You're very quiet today in the room. Okay, good. Just attentive. All right. Um, variation on this is diagrams. I went through this with the writing retreat. We did a, quite a long exercise about using a diagram as a writing trigger. Similarly to the sketch note, it really does stimulate the brain's tendency to prefer that kind of information. It's really good for structuring thinking, for synthesizing lots of different things into one place. Drawing with software can be time consuming. It's better to draw by hand. Um, and again, you've got that problem with searching for it, which might be solved by the phone. I haven't tested it out, but it depends. It doesn't do as well with special characters for people that care about, like if you write like hashtag or exclamation mark or something that I found not as good, but 
for word stuff. And I think most of the things we might use it for pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Okay. Um, anyway, so diagrams, are, um, and I could say a lot about diagrams, but I did that a lot yesterday and it is in our book, um, level up your essays, which is really written for undergraduates. We went to town on diagrams and that, um, but um, there's still a lot more that could be said about them. Um, write to me if you have trouble finding that. I've got lots. I use um, Scapple, which is by the people who invented Scrivener, Scapple. Yeah. Um, but I'm weird like that. Um, it's, it's a very free-form drawing program. A lot of people like... Um, what was someone brought up yesterday, the day before? Mine, it's, Miro. sorry? Miro's good as well. That's more for um, post-it note type of um, Miro, M-I-R-O. Yeah. Scapple, S-C-A-P-P-L-E. I've got a list of software at the end of this slide deck, though, and that, that is linked there. Xmind is another one. Suggestion? Uh, the slides are sorry? Um, um, did you use that for I wouldn't necessarily use something this pre-formatted. Um, usually I'll just get into circles and arrows and kind of flow charts and all sorts of Venn diagrams. Um, this is just one example. This is a feather diagram. Um, often they don't conform to any kind of diagram standard. They're kind of somewhere between a drawing and a diagram. Yeah, so that's just how I like to work, though. Not everyone is sort of visual or confident in drawing, although I would encourage you to just find a nice pen, find some nice paper. You've always been given notebooks as gifts, right, Like because that's what your family think you want. <laughs> And there's always a nice notebook and you think, oh, I should do something. You just set yourself like a challenge. I'm going to draw something every day and surprisingly builds up the muscle and the confidence around drawing. And they can be really terrible drawings too. Like give yourself permission, permission just to draw really badly. Someone online just recommended Whimsical. I have not heard of Whimsical, before, yeah. but it looks nice. That's why I love teaching. It's my favorite class to teach, by the way. I'm just eating it up like delicious yogurt because I learn so many new things. Sorry? Why is like W? Okay. W-I-S-E? Wise mapping. Wise mapping. All right, great. Thanks. I'll put that in the chat too. Wise All right. Mapping. So it doesn't have to be by hand. It can be digital. Um. My podcast co-host, Jason, like if you want to hear two people nerd out about this sort of stuff all the time, that's all we do in the podcast is nerd about this stuff. Um, he He's a real mind mapper and he writes all his papers, does all his presentations. He thinks in mind maps. I'm much more a free form drawer. So horses for courses. This is a method that Tiago Forte talks about mostly in his book. Actually doesn't spend time talking about the the note-taking methods like I have here really, except for this one. He talks about highlighting and he has this method he calls progressive highlighting where he selectively uses bold and colour changes in notes, either text that he's extracted usually from a document, highlights a bit that is important, then, then goes a second passes and bolds the bit that he thinks is really important. Now, I was taught when I first started my PhD insofar as one has ever taught anything in a PhD let's face it in terms of study skills one of the first things my supervisor said to me one of the only useful things he said to me to be honest um and he would say that was true as well um was that never read without a pen in your hand he said if you're not got a pen in your hand you're not really reading um or fingers on the keyboard um and the other thing I was taught I don't know by whom, was that it's a really bad idea to just highlight everything because it's very passive. You're not absorbing. You're not actually kind of consuming. Although I've come around and I'm a bit like, well, it depends. Like everything, it depends. Sometimes it's really good just to extract the text and put a highlighter over it. I find this particularly the case when I'm taking articles off the web or I'm scanning through papers that people have said you should read, but I don't really have a purpose for it yet. I don't want to invest myself in writing sentences 
because that's effort <laughs> and I don't really want to spend any, but there's bits of it I think are cool. And so it's actually become a remarkably useful part of my toolkit now that I've stopped being so um, rigorous about it and started to let myself have some legitimate academic deviance and highlight things. Um, the process that I use in Obsidian now is to highlight things in Zotero that automatically get dragged into Obsidian. So I often highlight and put a note next to it as well. So a sticky note on top of the highlight, that actually works quite well for me. So it can be passive. It is good to put things in your own words. You have to be really careful. We know this, but I'll just emphasize it. When you're taking words from other people to remember that you took the words because that's where plagiarism can happen is just in sloppiness. So always putting quotation marks around something or a color or something, some way of always distinguishing those in your database, particularly if you're using a database is really important. Questions about highlighting, comments, be opinions. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, you first, you first. So, they think I do a lot of like compliments, but basically, what I'm having is how to do it. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm going to do is that it can be very like, you know, that's a very good point. So, what is the advice like taking the book? Like, if they try to read the whole paper and then like write a sentence, you would say, you know, I think that someone who can read the whole thing without having the urge to write is probably highly done. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you. I find highlighting a really good way to stay engaged with the text, um, to keep my concentration and focus on it, to not forget which bits of it I thought were important. So generally speaking, if I had to say I had one way of doing this in terms of reading a paper, I highlight first, then I go back and write my sentences based on my highlights. But actually it tends to happen simultaneously now in Zotero. I highlight and then I type a little sticky note on top of it. And that sticky note can be a real mess. But I always put a verb. Things are picking up online here. So mm -hmm. uh, apologies for a question this late into the talk, which is okay. Questions are good. Uh, how exactly do you know what to take notes on? The problem I have is taking notes summaries of absolutely everything because everything seems important. I have a whole Word document of hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes I've never gone back to, wasted so much time doing this. Mm. Um, I started answering your question, by the way, uh, uh, by posting that link right below it to the progressive summarization technique. Yep. So that's worth looking at. But yep. any other thoughts, Inga? Um, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. You've prefigured the way okay. the way around that problem. Good, good, good. Yeah. Okay. And then also to add, because this is useful, thank you for uh, folks chiming in on this. I take audio notes as I go. Or yeah. My phone take notes. Love that. Good idea. You can do that with Apple Notes. Yeah. Otter AI changed my life. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Does script change my life? <laughs> so recording and transcribing is now very easy, very possible. Um, and so I find, though, that I don't write the way I speak. Um, speaking is... Uh, Speaking is a right branching syntax and has different kind of linguistic expressive ways of, I'm got, I haven't got the words. Speech and text are very different forms of English. They've deviated from each other. So you'll notice this if you try and use dragon speak, it's actually hard to speak academically into a computer. Um, so we can, if we're speaking conversation, we're actually speaking a different type of English than we speak on the page. On the page, it tends to be highly nominalized. So verbs have been turned into nouns and so on. All right. So, um, so while taking notes, audio is good. You won't tend to have notes that you can immediately transfer into other papers. That doesn't mean it's bad. And in fact, I think audio notes for meetings are the way to go and yeah. transcription services for meetings. And I really like two different ways of learning. And again, coming back to neurodiversity as an issue, if you if audio really works for you and it's a much better comprehension channel, absolutely lean into those technologies. And I'm really relieved that we have them. There's also services emerging that will read papers and digest them, supposedly. I have find they're a bit hit and miss, but I'm excited about the whole world of audio. And as a podcaster, because I just love audio, um, I think there's some really cool technology. Hmm. Even Word does transcription. Now. Even Word does yeah. transcription. Yeah. Not great. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Okay. Um, all right. Note taking tables. Um, so this is 
I know this slide is a lot and I apologize for people with dyslexia who are going to find this one hard to sit with. Um, it's an incredibly simple, and this answers to some extent some of the questions that have popped up in the past. It's a way of structuring your note taking that starts to do the synthesis at the same time as the analysis. So it's quite simple. The columns are papers, <laughs> paper titles across the top there. The rows are questions or themes. Rows can be anything you like. Um, but my example there on the table is about um, research about PhD students. So the first line is reasons that people give for undertaking a higher degree. The second one is completion rates. The third one is social learning in PhD student communities. And the fourth one is relationship with supervisor. How important is it? These are general themes that I'm interested in. You could even take your 12 questions and put them in this column. Um, and then when you're reading um, about reading any paper, these can get very big <laughs> um, or they can stay very tight just to a chapter or a paper. I find they're better if they're tight. Um, and then uh, under each, um, each um, box, you write using the Mewburn slash sentence method, um, your takeaway or your key point or your multiple key points there. Um, so this is a way of structuring um, the questions you might be asking at the text, the themes, the things that you're looking for with the notes themselves. And then when you come to write, you are writing literally across the table. The good thing about this and um, is that it also highlights silences. So if you've got a theme and you're reading across many different papers and not many people talk about it, this translates in a little literature review, for instance, into very few people talk about X. The exception is Mewburn 2012 who said this and what's his name 2013 that said this. No one else talked about it. Gap. Um, it, I find this extremely, I use these all the time. I particularly use these when co-writing because you can split the literature reading up you can also see if your co-author's done the reading and done the work or not. Um, it gives you access to their thoughts. It is a great way of synthesizing ideas as you go, of, of focusing down on your reading. It freezes your thoughts. You can take it up again when you've left it for a long period of time and the relationships and the relational thinking is there. Um, it's just one of the most simple and best methods I think I've ever been taught. I actually can't think of any cons. I just love it, but it works better when the purpose is clear. So there's a point where you might start off with Cornell tent note taking, or you might just write literature notes in Obsidian, which I'll get to in the second half. And then you flip into this method when you want to get much more detailed and start to bring all the ingredients of the stir fry together. You notice I put circles around there, around the verbs. So I'm combining those techniques. I do them often in Google Sheets because they're shareable and you can collaborate on them and you can comment on other people's um, work. Thoughts, comments, feel opinions. It's genius, isn't it? I didn't think it up, by the way. Yeah. It's a fun question here in the chat. Has anyone tried speaking notes, then asking chat GPT to make it better written text? Uh, plus, is this crossing the line of accept acceptable AI? I have tried it. It is good at it. I don't care about what's acceptable or not. Yeah. As long as you don't ask it to make stuff up, I just don't see it. I think we're having a moral panic about, yeah. about it. But that's my view. And don't break the rules of your institution. Yeah. Thoughts, feel opinion? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's an anxiety response. Yeah. You know how we do time boxing? set a timer. I know it takes me 40 minutes to read an academic paper properly. So I set a timer for 40 minutes. 
if I finish before that, that's okay. If I really feel I've read to the end and I've got what I needed from it. But I set a timer and I do, like I do that. I'm not going to lie and say that I don't ever do that. Plus sometimes I just get bored and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's also interesting. The other thing that I do to combat it is actually there's a step before things go into my reference manager. I blogged about this two blogs ago. Yeah. Can you find yeah, it and share it? Yeah. Um, where I talked about the, this concept of like the change room, you take a whole bunch of clothes into the change room and then you decide which ones you're actually going to try on, right? Like which ones you're actually going to buy. So what I do is I tend to try to not read anything but the abstract when I'm in search mode and I get very much into, I have learned this over time to control this problem, to use techniques from systematic literature search and keywords. Um, I use connected papers the tool connected papers to compile a huge list of papers. So at the moment, I think I've got a spreadsheet that has 500 of them in it. And then I actually go through, use the um, index, use the abstracts to just do a bit of hashtag kind of content analysis. So I have a, a column that's got hashtags in it. I've got a column that's got the year. And then I can sort them by time and I can sort them kind of by topic. And so that's a sort of slice and dice I do. And then I'm not allowed to search anymore. I have to confine myself to just that. Mind the gap in the literature. Yeah, that's what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Um, so I suppose my two answers are recognise it's kind of an anxiety response or a bored response and find ways to manage, manage the anxiety or the boredom rather than just sort of try and fix that particular problem does that help yeah, yeah. yeah. okay I just use an excel spreadsheet as the first pass so I get everything I go to I get them out of the database or google scholar or connected papers wherever they are I right click on the citation, I copy and I paste that in to each line. And then I add another column, which is where I transcribe the year, which is like a little bit more work than I want to, but okay. And then I have another column where I've just got, for instance, the one I'm doing on neuro neurodiversity has hashtag ADHD, hashtag autism, hashtag academic, hashtag something. And then I can do very crude searches through. And then I can say, okay, I want to look at the papers that are only about autistic adult academics um, about academic practice. There's 11 in the world, I think. Although someone sent me one the other day, I'm like, damn it, because people keep publishing them. So, you know, you can have search words on Google and stuff, but I've decided to just freeze it here. And then I do, I'll do citation searches on the ones I think are important. Mm. 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 Do it in Excel. You can search it. Yeah. And then, um, I, I it's probably a longer question and I probably should take it offline and do it separately. I just got a glance at the time. Yeah. Meeting notes, I'll just briefly go across this. If you, like most of the conflict I see between students and supervisors is because someone hasn't taken good meeting notes. This is a, a method. Again, it's a table method. The discussion point is on one side and your margin notes on the other. It helps you, I find it helps to tune in if I'm taking notes, I write them by hand. Um, it tracks ideas, it helps you with to-do items, it avoids arguments about who thought of what. So it can be hard to listen and write at the same time, but I think it's a skill worth developing. I'm not gonna spend any more time on it other than to just remind ourselves that meeting notes are actually useful and recordings of meetings that are then transcribed is another way to do it. Uh, during the pandemic, um, the, the only PhD student I've got at the moment, she's just finishing up. Well done, Leanne, amazing thesis. Um, we have ended up 
flipping to Zoom um, because we had to. And then we realized that we wanted to stay in Zoom because she recorded every meeting. And that was great. I was happy for her to do that. Um, now, you have two options. We're going to take a 15-minute break because I need to eat something or I'm just going to die probably. Um, and uh, you can either at home or here try one of those techniques. You can also take a break like me. How are we going to manage breaks in the room, Tyler? Um, a couple of us have card access, right? If we wanted to take people out to the restroom breaks and everything, I'll get your sandwich and things. So if we want to do a quick thing, but remember, you'll need us to get out. Out. Well, not to get out, to to, uh, to get back in. So, and also if you need to use the bathroom, you need us to. So maybe one of us one could of us. do bathroom duty. Yeah. And just stand outside and maybe run between each one. Yeah. We're going to start again at, at three. Yeah, it's like they're. Um, it's very evil. It, it's new though, but I decided I'm a fan of these. And I was like, yeah. Hell yeah. Bit of sweet, you know? Yeah. All right. Let's get restart? back in and refocus. Online people also return to wherever you are. Come back from the bathroom or the kitchen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've had a long talk about different types of note taking. Are there any sort of questions? burning thoughts that you want to express before we move on to systems, including online. No. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You mean where to find things? That's what we're going to talk about now. Systems, yeah. All right, so it's one thing to take the notes. It's another thing to find them again when you need them. And the, the classic problem is that the retrieval context is different from the storage context. And by that I mean um, back when we used to do paper paper filing, which is when I did my PhD, which wasn't that long ago, at least to, from my perspective, I printed out all the papers that and wrote in the margins, highlighted, whatever. Then I had many folders where I'd, you know, like punch holes in the notes and put them in a folder so I could find them again because we didn't really have databases. So I was sort of handling handling a lot of paper material. And I'd go through this process where I'd file the notes by author and then I could never file, find anything. And then I filed the notes by topic and then I'd look for a particular author and it wouldn't be in the topic that I thought it should be, all right? So that's a classic retrieval context versus filing context. When you filed it, you were filing it with the intention of finding it later by topic, but later you come to it and you want to search by author and in that paper system it didn't afford both. Okay, luckily with digital systems, we can kind of bridge that divide, but the problem still remains. You need to probably keep your notes in multiple places. Sorry, not sorry. Um, although I will talk about Obsidian towards the end, which is the closest I've got, I think, to a full solution. It still means that there are probably notes everywhere. Um, I'm going to, thank you for respecting my privacy, pass around my um, bullet journal while I talk. And you can have a flip through that because I'm going to talk about bullet journal in a, in a second. It makes more sense if you see what someone. So go through it fairly swiftly. So just sort of have a look at the index page, particularly at the start. The index page is the most important thing. Um, I talked about this in the writing retreats. It's unhelpful to think about our minds as machines or muscles. They're not. They're not machines because they're not reliably can do the same thing over and over again. It doesn't matter how much we try to train them, they might not necessarily get any better. It's a bit better to think about your mind as an orchestra or a flock of birds. It's connected, it's relational, it's often emotional, what we remember. Um, and visual um, and sense sensory. And that can also account for many different neurodiversities. You might have more strength in one area than others. So taking that in mind, 
um, that means that the note-taking system needs to conform to you, not the other way around. And this takes a bit of hacking and a bit of work. Um, here's how most filing systems work. You're either in a filing cabinet or a laundry basket. I'm a filing cabinet because I've been using computers since the 80s. Um, and back then you had a C colon prompt and you had to search things recognize okay these are the old timey days and so I learned that every piece of information has a certain location in a computer and I need to know where that location is to find it again it's a file folder and they're nested in different drives you can think about the drive like the drawer of a filing cabinet and the file folder as the file folder so we the the even the iconography inside a computer and the way we talk about things goes to a filing cabinet but in reality modern tools dear old google drive has enabled us to treat the inside of our computer like a laundry basket so you try to find something you just search for it all right who's a filing cabinet welcome <laughs> I know it's forcing you into the laundry basket I feel you it's horrible um laundry basket lovers out and proud <laughs> you're born into it that's fair enough too okay both of them are bad okay filing cabinet is how a computer works but again you've got that retrieval context if you've buried something four folders deep there's no way necessarily you're going to remember where everything is necessarily you've got to keep a big map in your head about where everything is and that's exhausting and it can change the laundry basket is bad for all the reasons you know if you don't remember what if it hasn't got anything distinctive about it it's hard to find i know for instance that there's one slide that i keep forgetting to store somewhere good that's got particular kind of research finding on it. I know that I gave it in a lecture in Portugal in 2015. It's in Google Drive somewhere. Every time I want that graphic, I type Portugal. There it is. Do you yes. have, yeah, yeah, similar? It's easier that way. It is, but not everything is Portugal, unfortunately, because Portugal's lovely, by the way. All right. So not everything is Portugal. So the laundry basket works if the piece of clothing is distinctive. If it isn't, then you're in trubs, right? Trouble, trubs. Yep. All right. What we actually need to work towards, this is an Amazon robotic warehouse floor. Have you seen these? There's one near my parents' house. Yeah. Have you been inside? No. It's like it's like the Death Star. It is the Death Star. And in fact, these things zip around and the whole floor is kind of gridded and they are, do not respect humans. And if humans get on the floor, they can die. And so like humans not allowed. And then they turn off squares, right? And humans have to pick their way through the squares like it's a video game to find the broken robot. Okay. They whiz around everywhere. And in fact, Amazon is a laundry basket. When something comes in, they just put it in a basket in these big racks. And then they just shove it there. Those racks can have anything. They've got no relation. They'll have like squeezy stress balls in one and Inga Mewburn's How to Fix Your Academic Writing Trouble. Great book. In the next one, you know. And so someone shopping for a squeezy ball is probably not also shopping for um, academic writing trouble. But the robots know where, can find where things are. They're all coded somehow. They zip around. They lift that off and they bring it to you. So they don't bother trying to file things in Amazon. That's a strength. But they have robots that can find things. That's a strength. So we need laundry basket and robots. Sorry. <laughs> but I would like you to just quickly on a piece of paper, I'll just give you five minutes because I am running behind time. Okay. Yeah, no, but I've got a lot. <laughs> you know, you said, oh, I'll put another hour in. So I <laughs> kind of did that. Five minutes. Just draw what you already do because I just want you something like this. Where does information come in and where does it go out? Yeah, okay, fine. Try to draw it as a flow. Excuse me for eating my sandwich. Should I, like, turn my turn myself off so people don't have to see me eating my sandwich? The only risk is like if they screen capture you with like the most unflattering 
Anymore. You can screen cap me now. If you're still online, Rosalind, don't share it. Yeah, the Amazon warehouse is definitely evil, but when I'm there with my parents, we get same day shipping. Oh my we god. Morning. Nice. Oh, Coral gray area. Shipping is amazing. <laughs> Are there people still joining this late? They've come like, coming back. A bunch of people left during the breakout. Mm. So like a few have kind of come in and out since then. Because we were at like remember 35 or 37 or something online. So people internet have been coming back. If they were in Australia, it's getting really late. Oof. Like, way even late night. I'm surprised to see any. Yeah. Oh. I saw a few names I recognize. Good chat. Good chat comments going on. Oh, good. Uh, so I will say that. Oh, yeah, midnight over there. Wow. Mm. Oh, good. I rate that sandwich. That's their like their fancier line. It goes on the top shelf, and then the, uh, the generic ones. Are, oh, do they? The oh, but cool. they are better. Mm. This is not. Probably not the one that I was after, but it's actually very nice. Oh, okay. I like the super nutty super seed. Oh, just... I'm not sure if they're not doing it anymore because I haven't seen it for a while. I'm not sure. This is the first super one I saw. I'm like, mm. oh, it's healthy. I'm like, oh, it's healthy. I'm ruining my dinner. Dinner at Wilson. All right. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Again, that's right. Yeah. Mm. The eagle. Oh, I'm right. excited. Oh, even better. Yeah. Mm. If they have it, it's usually seasonal, but DNA cheesecake is really good. I forget what that even stands for now. Dark chocolate, something in mm -hmm. Amaretto. Oh, did they? Nougat Amaretto or something. Oh, that's sorry, nice. That was season. pretty sweet. It's really good. Mm -hmm. You never go up and see one from the MS, but like I usually gravitate towards the, the side. Yeah. <laughs> like to me, yeah. this is better than pasta or mm. arrow. Or the caramel pasta. is really nice. Oh, I'm going to give myself the caramel one. Oh, well. No. Too late. <laughs> well, the classic latte is good to know. Uh, Where's my bullet journal got to? Good, good. It's checking. What quite a number of writing retreat people come. I recognize <laughs> well over a dozen like faces and names from writing retreat. So pretty good. Yeah, I'm glad we managed to do this because I think it's really important. They already self-organized the next week. They want to do a writing group thing next week and i was like I'll you're gonna join yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, do, I'll that'd be good for you too i'll facilitate too and i will mm. write i'll shut up and write too mm. i'm really impressed by that though in terms of like you have to organize it yourself and like okay we will yeah no they're very proactive group i'm taking one more bite it's got apple in it it's nice mm. yeah. oh yeah how was the dinner last night the player oh, hall thing? Cool. I've never been actually. Beef Wellington. Oh, that's one of my favorite. It's a thing. beautiful Swedish uh -huh. 60s design. Uh -huh. And the master is an architect. Oh, fun. And we just went full nerd. Uh -huh. And then he immediately took me downstairs and showed me all the old drawings and the models. And then we were late for dinner because we were, <laughs> and he's like, oh, no one can eat until I eat. Anyway, that's I had fun. a great time. That's fine. Mm. Okay. How did you go with that? What did you notice? Any and all observations are good. Put, pop them in the chat. I hear the chat's popping off. Mm -hmm. I've only got it out of the corner of my eye. What did you notice? The 
so they're going from one place down to another place and they're not like mine here it's sort of landing in one one place yeah that's not necessarily a problem so long as you've got a system and you know what type of information is going into each place yeah you don't but <laughs> work towards yeah what else did you notice Yeah, so it's sort of like a pinball machine. They kind of like cascade down in, yeah, yeah and then just disappear down. Mm. 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 Yeah, what are we seeing online? Some good ones here. So we've got to rely too much on Mendeley. We've got to, some stuff is connected, some is an island. A lot of my stuff goes into Obsidian, good segue, but then it makes it hard to search. Oh. Oh. The step between Mendeley and compiled notes from different sources brought together ahead of writing is missing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh, a Notion person. I like Notion. In Notion, I have a directory of note cards in each thing I read. They have tags that I add. I also have topic pages in which I can drop URLs for Google Docs and things that I might lose. Cool. So Notion and Obsidian are similar yeah. Types of databases. Notion's a little bit more full fat. Obsidian is skim milk. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a reason I'm drinking skim though in my uh, chocolate too. Um, I do like, look, I witnessed you with the filing cabinet and in my heart, I'm still a filing cabinet girl. And there is still stuff that needs to be arranged on our computer in file folders. And it's better if there's something around that that makes sense. Tiago Forte's suggestion, I find works, all right? Projects, areas, resources, archives. Project is whatever currently is being done at the moment. For instance, I've got a neurodiversity book. We're writing The Distracted Academic. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, it will be. And a lot of this stuff will probably go in there in some format, plus our craft of research series that we've been cooking. So um, so projects, those, those are the sort of projects that stay up there. That Sometimes they're joint and shared projects with other people as well. will have its own folder. Just call it what it is. You can put a date on it if you like. I don't find dates particularly helpful at a project level. Then you've got areas. They're your life responsibilities. I've got taxes, right? Actually, I have a whole folder called life admin. And within that, I have taxes, I have medical records, I have my CV, I have anything that is kind of Mrs. Mewburn. She exists as a person separate to Professor Mewburn. Mrs. Mewburn stuff ends up in life admin. Um, and then I have um, director admin, a new admin. Is, and then I do that by year. So every new year, I take everything out and I put it in a folder with the year on it. And then the root directory is just for ANU admin and anything that's work related, I chuck in that laundry baskets. So they often my file systems and what he advocates here too is quite shallow, three folders deep at most. The deeper that the folders get, the harder it can be to find things in the crevices. So projects, areas, fairly self-explanatory. Resources, that's stuff that supports anything else you're doing. For instance, I worked with this awesome editor once and I, she said, I don't have time to finish off the copy editing, but here's the style sheet that I use on your books. And it's just gold. Like this style sheet, I've given it to so many other people. It's how to do hyphens, M dashes, when to hyphenize, when to use a number, when to use a let. Like it's, it's, and I've added to it over time. Um, and so that sits under my resource area. As a good example of something that could be used anywhere, maybe professionally, maybe personally, um, that you need to come back to. I try to keep that resources thing quite small. I don't want to just chuck everything in there. Some things that could go in resource actually sit in the project because that's where it best is found together. But resources and archives, stuff you don't need not right now, but you don't want to throw out. Or as I call it, the maybe later folder. Um, sits in there as well when stuff I'm not really sure where that fits into my life. There's a maybe later folder in archive because really I'm never going to look at it. All right. So when a project is done, the project can go in the archive. Think about how great it's going to be when you take your PhD folder, put it in the archive. That's where mine is now. Feels great. All right. Um, 
Bibliographic software, great place to keep notes. Um, I have folders by topic there. Um, I use the highlight and sentence method in there. As I mentioned, I highlight in a particular color of highlighter because that gets dragged into my obsidian. I'll get to that. Um, you can use um, Zotero does integrate with various different other pieces, bits and pieces of software. I advocate Zotero not because I think it's wonderful. It's ugly. It's a little bit not 90s. It needs a refresh. It hasn't got every single feature. On the other hand, it's open source. It's owned. It's got an open kind of policy around ownership. It's you don't not have to pay for it. Yeah. Although you can, and I do, because I just want to support the work. But it's not owned by Elsevier. Yeah. A couple of people online have mentioned Mendeley. I love Mendeley. Mendeley was my first love after EndNote, which is dead to me uh, because it did a really weird thing with my thesis just before I handed it in, which I have documented on the blog. It's just dead to me. People tell me that it's improved. Fine. I'm, we just don't have a relationship anymore. Yeah. Mendeley was my next boyfriend. I love Mendeley. And Mendeley really did introduce the idea of kind of, you know, playlists. Um, and um, and then I went to Papers 2 because I use a Mac and I use Scrivener and that was beautiful integration. <laughs> no one else used Paper 2. I didn't care. It was my database. It worked beautifully with everything. And then they screwed it up. I don't know what they did, but they made it bad. And so now I'm back in Zotero. I've learned to love it. Yeah. I think most, uh, for people that are familiar, like most Cambridge libraries tend to like nudge us towards Zotero. Like if you wanted a little bit of upskilling on that, you're more likely to get like a training or a workshop or oh my God, some that's libraries advanced. are really cool. Ours is still it. EndNote because it was the first to market. They kind of got the librarians and then they've never. I actually didn't know EndNote still existed. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to live in Tyler World. Oh. Many ways, not just for the donuts. All right. But anyways, Zotero pretty yeah. good. Like some libraries even like will say like, oh, one-to-one -one sessions on how to use Zotero. So take advantage of that if you can. In the end, you do you, okay? No judgment, no shame. But um, it is a good place to keep your notes. Nothing wrong with keeping your notes there. Downside of it as a system is sometimes it's hard to search your notes. It's hard to search notes since Zotero. You need to extract them out. I don't know what Mendeley is like now. I don't know what EndNote's like now. If it provides you a way to search through your notes, then that's maybe a good place to leave your notes. Um, but I, I take it out. Any other questions or thoughts about Bibliographic, yep. Mendeley, you mean? I don't know. Sorry, I we broke up. Um, yeah, for all sorts of reasons. One of them being just that they were bought by a Sevier and they just made it bad. It, it is the work of a, a week or so to take the paper kids and moved to a new home. I took the kids with me. So I do spend one day a year, it's in my diary, which is database, you know, which is Zotero cleaning day. And I throw things out. I know that's shocking. A lot of people say that whenever I tweet about, I used to tweet, I thread now. Mm -hmm. I mastodon, I toot on the masty. Um, whenever I talk online about the fact that I'm in the throw out day, people get very shocked by that. But you have to throw stuff out. You can always find stuff again. Finding stuff again is not a problem. It's a little bit Marie Kondo, if people still understand who that is. Yeah, it is Marie bit. Kondo. And I, I do Marie Kondo my references. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I stand by it. But you do you. I just offer it to you. It's like put a day in your diary, make it recurring once a year. It's a celebratory day where you just clean up your database. And I often clean my desk at the same time. Like I have an office cleaning and I'm thinking I probably need two days a year where I just do that. I think it's I actually, protect it. that was just, in the book yeah. actually too, but like, so yeah. like clean spaces, psychologically, like tidy desks and tidy uh, virtual things do seem to like lower our stress and make us feel a little bit more productive and connected. So it's silly, but if it's silly and it works, how silly is it? So keep it in mind, tidy desk, that is a procrastination thing, but like as a, uh, but if you've office. timed it and you've protected it yeah. and it's a day where you just be with your staff and care for it, yeah, then it's not procrastination. Yeah. It's work. Yeah, it's an investment in yeah. your like future productivity. Yeah. Think about it. 
Yeah. We write that in the book. Yeah. Thanks. Make a note of that, please, Tyler. All right. Bullet journal. I sent it around. Bullet journal is an excellent way to keep notes if you like to write by hand, which I personally do. Trained as an architect, you can see there in my architecture handwriting. I love doing it. It's meditative to me. It feels good. Um, it's easy to set one up. Jason Downs and I are working on, and by articulating this publicly in a recorded fashion, it will happen. We are making a bullet journal for academics, bullet journal. It's going to be a bullet journal. <laughs> with some pre-made spreads and stuff in it to help academics, like time for the academic year, genius, right? Don't steal my idea, please. Um, all right. There's posh pre-numbered ones. That's what this is. It costs about 20 quid probably in your terms. I put stickers so I know which journal it is, so I personalise it. Um, okay. So you set aside the first six pages or you use the index that's provided. And really, as you go through and you write notes, you simply write the theme of the page or the paper or the book that you were reading, and you write the page number on which those notes appear. And then if you've run out of that page or you come back to write notes subsequently, you'll see that there's multiple numbered notes. So if you look down there, um, I think it's on induction, which is a project actually. It's on page 58, 59, and on page 80. It just continues through. It doesn't matter what else is in between. It just is that particular thought group goes on multiple pages. Um, it works on a daily log system. You just write the date at the top, which you would have seen. You write down whatever comes at you, thoughts, notes, whatever. Collections are a good way to actually keep track of literature notes, right? So if you're reading something or you're trying to extract data, start a collections page and it's the collections page that end up in the index okay you don't like every daily note doesn't end up there it has a notation system it was designed by Ryder Carroll I've got that yeah, right yeah, that's right he has ADHD this is a system his mother who was a school teacher and he himself developed together to combat his ADHD in high school and it's it's genius and this has actually provoked my interest in neurodiversity because I'm like, people are really clever at solving their own problems. And I want to know more of how people with ADHD and autism solve their problems. Um, but it's simple. There's a to do is a dot point. So anything that's a dot has to be done. Anything that is done, you put the cross through the dot. If you don't do it, you put an arrow so you know the dot's got to move. And if it's not relevant or a to do list, it just has a line. You can add more. I added a move to my diary, so I put a little arrow, and you can see that up the top, that that's moved to my diary, that top one. You can see here that everything was done or it was migrated, which is the forward arrow there. Genius about this is you just write down things as they come at you, so you can just capture it on the page and you don't have to think about it anymore. And then if you don't do it, it remains there as a dot. So as you're scanning back through, remember I said about visual fields, as you're scanning back through, something with the dot sort of jumps out of the page at you and you think, oh, have I done that or not? And you go back and check and you can cross it off or whatever. Um, you'll see that um, that bullet journal has been with me, I think, for nearly a year. Um, I, I Six months to a year, depending on how busy I am. With the sabbatical, it slowed right down. So I'm not bullet journaling as much because I haven't got as many to-dos. But the other way about the bullet journal, what's really good about um, it for taking notes and being a system for taking notes is that every now and then you just stop and you have a page dedicated to a project or perhaps it's to a book or to an article. You write the title at the top. I put a box around it. Again, with the visual field when I'm flicking through, I can see the boxes pop out at me. Um, they're just like a daily log. They can have to-dos in them or they can just have notes, right? And this is just the notes for the craft of academia. And then that page number goes in the index. And if I subsequently do another page continuing on the notes from the same book, I can put a slash there and put the other page number. So you can go backwards and forwards. You can see backwards and forwards across and just skip by pages without going back to the index. Is your mind blown now? Yeah. yeah. We had one question online yeah. uh, from the previous slide. What does the double X mean? Kiss, kiss. Where's the double X? 
I think it's, is it that? Oh, that was me just getting frustrated when I was oh, okay. talking to someone. Okay. X, double X means frustration. I'm like, do it, do it. Yeah. Well, I was in that meeting. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Anyway, yes, yeah, that doesn't mean anything other than that I was frustrated at that time. Yeah. Um, the weird thing about bullet journal is it's profoundly simple, but somehow hard to start. I don't know what it is. Like I, I read all the stuff and I was like, I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> and then someone showed me one and I was like, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. And you don't have as many things to lose. Yeah. I did the same Thank thing. Thank you. You've, you've, one thing takeaway. The other thing is I've got little stickers that I put down the side when I'm done. Bujo 001, Bujo 002, Bujo 003 and the dates. It sits on my shelf. I've got an index of the indexes. And I'm like, I know I did that. Oh, there it is. It's like three Bujos ago. I think looking at like really tangible examples like when you showed me this i had the same things like oh now i get it you've been using like, it right yeah now thanks to like looking at this one first and being like okay i looked at all the things and i was like i sort of get it but then walking through it and it's like okay now i understand how to use it now i will start using it this way now i do yeah and then you left yours in in america yep. which is a sad time which is why i have that note that you would have seen at the front please call me if you find this my sister lost hers and she had the phone number and she got a call and she had a really fun time talking to the guy that found it on the train and rescued it for it. My friend Jason buys one of those, you know, like a tile or a find my thing that you have from Apple. Yeah. You can buy them in credit card RFID side. He sticks it in the back because we're both, if you listen to On The Reg, you'll hear us talk about it like a lot. And there's some of our most popular exercises which i don't get because i don't see how audio format is great for this sort of thing but people love them this one's got a little pocket at the back he slips it in there and he can always find it it fell off my bike once it was a bad time that's the only that's the only downside of it although you can take photos of it and put it somewhere else so you don't have to choose refuse to choose oh one good question here from mm. uh online how do you use it meaning the bullet journal to manage and keep track of multiple direct projects i think it was the constant copying stuff to the next day that killed it for me uh, okay you're too busy that's a sign you're too busy mm -hmm. if you are constantly migrating you're doing too much got the uh the open smiley face response. okay good yeah you can also do spreads. So for instance, my sabbatical planner, I don't know if anyone saw that, was flicking through enough to see it, but I've got every day of what I'm doing and I sort of run it in a calendar format so that it's continuous so you can really see time. And this is another ADHD thing. Um, ADHD has a thing called time blindness. Not everyone experiences it, but they've got incredible techniques for getting over time blindness and I don't have time and I'm going to get nerd sniped and sidetracked if I do that so um, look yeah. it up time blindness there's all sorts of timers and stuff that have been developed right it blows your mind anyway Bujo's amazing collection's amazing all right I'm going to run out of time it's quarter to four I'm going to have to talk through this like I did last time okay which is yeah. not ideal yeah something that's become very popular is called the Zettelkasten or slip box and it was written up in Zonka Aaron's How to Take Smart Notes and it was based on the most prolific 19th century professor, Professor Lerman. This is a picture of a Zettelkasten. The idea behind a Zettelkasten based on index cards where you just wrote um, a note and you started to put similar topics together and you'd build up kind of collections or bunches of related writing. And the idea behind this is that structure of the piece of writing that you're working on could emerge bottom up from the pieces um, and also that when you wanted to write about something, it was simply a matter of collecting it and dumping it, sorting it on the, the table, moving it around and so on. That's the idea behind the Zettelkasten. And he was an amazingly prolific writer in a time when it was hard to be fast because we didn't have computers. It has spawned a whole YouTube, if you know, you know, and some of you have gone Zettelkasten YouTubing. Anyone has gone Zettelkasten YouTubing? It's the dream, right? 
we've had this conversation already, but it's a dream like, oh, if I do Z or casting, it's going to solve every problem I've ever got. Do not believe it. It's I just don't think it's true. But I think some of these concepts are really valuable. So the idea of writing small, densely interconnected notes is really good. I highly recommend reading how to write smart notes. In a sense, this is a Zettelkasten, right? It's indexed. You can find things. Things that are related together can be encouraged to stay together. This is a Zettelkasten on an index notes, but mostly people are using it um, in, uh, in relational databases, which I'll get to. So it's got three parts to it. Three types of notes. And again, you could just do them in here. Uh, fleeting notes, thoughts, things to follow up on, just really quick notes like the logging in the bullet journal. Literature notes, things you just write about other people's work using the Mewburn sentence method, right? Um, and then permanent notes. These are like the output that's sometimes described as the Zettel Carsten, where you just write about a single idea or topic. And if you're in a relational database like Obsidian, you can link back to original sources as you write. They're like little chunks. Now, Barbara Kamler and Pat Thompson, Pat Thompson hero, a great friend of mine, really amazing scholar, they said something very simple, which is writing chunks, not in chapters. As soon as you put a chapter and you start to try and structure it, you can lose sight of all the parts or you don't know how to wrangle it in. If you write chunks in the way that, the Zettelkasten system encourages you to do, the chunks can be blended, moved together, melded into chapters. And this is how I write. And this is how we will write our book. Chunks, not chapters. How the chunks happen doesn't matter really. Bullet journal, obsidian, whatever. The, the basic principle is the same. Fleeting notes, literature notes, but at a certain point you sit down and in your own words, you write an idea as fully as you need to, referring out to all the literature and notes, hopefully linking them in so you can find them again and then start to build your work from the bottom up. At a certain point, it's my experience, you have to also top down and bottom up at the same time. It's not one or the other. And any time that someone says to you, it is this way, it's usually not. That's just what I found. So... Bullet Journal is Zettelkasten ish, but the most popular ones are relational databases, which are basically personal Wikipedias. Obsidian, Rome Research, and Notion are all related databases. My preference for Obsidian is simple. It uses a file format called Markdown, which is basically a simplified HTML. You don't need to get into it too much. It's just it's a text file. It's got some fanciness to it. Obsidian makes Markdown files. Markdown files can be opened in a text file editor like Word. So your database consists of a bunch of note files that can be exported to any format you like. So if Obsidian goes, as we in Australia say, I'm just going to say it. If Obsidian goes tits up. I think they say that here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. Then I've still got all my notes. Uh, unfortunately, a, a, a system like Rome Research, I don't know what export functions they give you anymore, but if they go tits up, your notes are gone too. And also if you have to pay every year to access your own thoughts, what happens when you don't want to or can't keep paying or forget? Rome so, is too expensive too. Rome is 165 US dollars a year now. There's some sort of educational yeah. discount. Notion's but... expensive too. Yeah. I started Thesis Whisperer Junior off on Notion when he started Juni and then had regrets and I've been moving into Obsidian because <laughs> I didn't want to keep paying for his Notion subscription. He loves Notion though. He started his undergraduate oh, with Notion. Good for him. Wow. I know. Better so than lucky. 99% of everything. All right. Now, given that we're in the interest of time, um, I've said I've blog posted blog posted, blogged, a workflow in Obsidian, which you can read. It's got lots of links. I've done a nerd out on a video about how to connect Zotero and Obsidian together. Okay. They're both linked there. Hi, Inga here. Right. I'm not going to play it. There's a film in the Wilson gun. Very nice. Inside Obsidian. Now, just a bit on Obsidian, fair warning, Obsidian is what I call agricultural in that it's not, it is actually beautifully designed product, quietly beautiful, but it's kind of ugly and very 90s in its sensibility, which means that there's a lot of community plugins that are written for it. So people do all sorts of amazing creative things, 
but they write release notes that are terrible. You can't understand how to put them together. You're on YouTube for four days trying to work out that someone didn't document a missing step. Fair warning, if you're going to Obsidian, you're going hard. You have to commit. You can't dabble. 90s is retro now, which is sad. So retro means I know. cool. I was a full grown-up yeah. in the 90s, so that's weird to me. All right. Um, I have linked Obsidian and ChatGPT together in two, wait, three ways. I use the Smart Connections plugin. So if you type Smart Connections in the community section, you can find it. I put a link there to it. Um, what it does is it um, it creates a backend to ChatGPT OpenAI, which opens up a chat window inside Obsidian. It reads all your notes. That's the trade-off, right? You've got to be prepared to share your database with OpenAI and not know what they do with it. Big trust issues. The good thing about Obsidian is you can have multiple vaults. So if you've got sensitive data, just don't plug this in. Simple. Um, ChatGPT appears in a window to the side and you can ask it stuff. You can brainstorm with it. You can ask it to look at your, you know, what other things in my database look like this. You can talk to it. It's actually pretty amazing. Um, I feel like I'm living in the future when I do that. I've got my little AI automated research intern and I imagine that intern as this young man here we got Dali said cute smart intern wearing glasses didn't say gender but it gave me a white guy he's quite cute so that's right all right um the smart connections also works as a file so what it does you can also you can query chat gpt but you can also just get it to use machine learning to find similar files in your database so one of the things that um, obsidian will do will allow you to create links this here is a link link out but you can create links inside as well so you can surf between one note and the other now the zettelcast and idea is that you make lots of links inside your notes and then you surf your database and blah 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 blah. and look it's a great idea but i'm not good at making the links i forget i don't know what the links should be i feel like i'm somehow not doing zettelcast and right and as soon as i have that feeling i know that it's kind of rubbish that i've been told that this is the right way to do something there isn't um and so i plugged in this smart files and it just tells me what other ones look like it so i can surf between my notes this way there is a full list of 90 style program hacks and tips um, for you to explore one of the and I might just demonstrate one feature because it's cool um, which is in here uh, I need to share don't I I'm not sharing am I uh, not anymore now all right so if I go to say ADHD, the nervous system and thinking, I've just got a bunch of like cut and paste stuff in here, like a whole bunch of mess, right? You can see how I've highlighted it for myself. I've just written some of it stream of consciousness, some of it isn't. It's just a blah, right? You know how I said sentence method? Don't always follow my own advice. All right. Control P text. And I'm generating here from a template. My template is summarize. Please work for me, Chatty. There it is. So remember the Cornell template? That does it. It does a pretty good job. Also handily pops it in a box so that I know that it's not my writing, which is handy. Now, if I just want a summary for my own purposes to remember what was in this really messy note, which is meant to be one of those settled cast and permanent notes, but it's a mess, Chatty G's made it for me. Your mileage may vary. All right, so I could click and drag. And in the I usually do this workshop as a whole day at ANU. And I have a little team of my Obsidian nerd posse. We have an email list and they come along and in the afternoon they sit with people and do it because it's not easy to set up. So I feel like I've sort of given you this thing that you go, oh, that's amazing. And then you will spend weeks um, 
I can answer questions as best I can while I'm here and I I do answer emails. Um, but there are those links. Sorry, I'll just reshare this. Where am I? There. That is a goodish set of links. So if you want to, if you want to be able to drag the Zotero links into the highlights from Zotero straight into Obsidian, there's a template that sets up all the bibliographic details, takes all your notes, all your memos drags it across. That's the Zotero plugin there. The Smart Connections plugin is where I'm chatting with Chatty G and the Text Generator plugin is where I'm summarising with Chatty G. It's all there as a starting point. Um, I don't have further time to do that. There's a video. This is the best one I could find. Don't believe him with his enthusiasm about it, but he's got some really excellent tips to share. It gets you into mocks, maps of content, and then you know you're down the rabbit hole. Just enjoy. In this video, we're going to dive into the note making app. There's more Obsidian. All right. There's some bullet journal stuff there. There's links to some of the um, the things that I've mentioned. I'm running out of steam. There's the links to some of the software. Yep. Okay. We've got five minutes of questions. I'm really sorry. Are there any online? Uh, one question here. I noticed that you use a workflow that includes uh, transferring data to Readwise. Oh yeah, Readwise mm. first, and then only moving that into, uh, and then moving that into Obsidian. What's yep. the advantage of that? Um, when I'm reading a Kindle book, I highlight and it goes straight into Obsidian with all the bibliographic details. Yeah, and it updates so that next time I go back to that book, if I've highlighted some more or taken notes, so it sort of replicates what I do in Zotero, but in Kindle books, and also on the web. That's pretty streamlined. Yeah. It's great. It's really good, uh, but it costs money and I don't love that. So try not to get too dependent. Uh, it costs about, I mean, when I say it costs money, it costs about eight US a month, which is not nothing. It depends on what you think you're getting out of it. Yeah. I don't like to recommend things to students that are a lot of money. Mm. Uh, five minutes left. Questions uh, in the. Sometimes. Sometimes I retype. Um, I used to take photos and put it in Evernote and use it OCR searching. I found I didn't really use it. Most of the time I retype. I've stopped taking notes, writing notes out of books by hand now. With Readwise and Zotero, I don't do it. This becomes more of my project space. I put it there as an option. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. I'm going to um, it's too late to do the whole thing, yes. Yeah, no, like, I, I, yeah, but, yeah. But you think a worth trying to like, yeah, take yeah. bits and pieces and slowly, like, slowly, slowly, and then you might decide quickly that you can do it. That's going to be up to you, I think. I wouldn't stop an overhaul just because you've got anxiety from this session. I'd say, okay, that sentence method looks really cool. I'll start there. Yeah. The Mewburn sentence method. <laughs> Any more questions around? Do I have a dream of one system that does it all? Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I really hope so. Like I would hate to think Obsidian was the end of it because to me that plugging in Chatty G is like a game changer and I dream of a system that has a bibliographic database built in that, you know, someone will build it. The good thing about I feel comfortable investing in Obsidian because of its markdown file format. They are just text files. That means the next thing that comes along I can transfer is when I transferred out of Evernote, which has been acquired as losing staff, 
has all the hallmarks of the stink of death about it that I thought, right, I have to get out. I don't want to be caught short with my stuff in here. And I had years of stuff in there. Um, I found that transferring it out, sitting in front of the television. I don't watch Friends, but it's the equivalent of Friends being on the television, you know, below decks. Um, I just sat and transferred it out bit by bit and weeded it and it took weeks. It was my summer holidays. That and cleaning up my bookmarks and my password database. So, so, but I feel like with Obsidian, I'll have a bunch of text files and I can do stuff with those. But yeah, something better should come along. I hope so. I think it will mm. with almost certainty. And I say this for my somewhat cynical, but not uninformed ex tech background is there's a lot of money in like the productivity yeah. wars or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. The dream, excuse me, the dream for them is sort of like get bought out by Microsoft or Google, make a product terrible, but then they make their money from that. And then that's what Microsoft or Google want in terms of like, we have the killer app now that brings you into our ecosystem. So there, there's a lot of incentive to kind of like push it and bring in terms of AI. So I would almost certainly guess the next. If they make that subscription months. on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. We need Secret early adopters to kind of like figure these things out for us and figure out like, you know, what's good, what's going to stick. And then this could change. This will very likely change 12 months from now. Yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on this space. It's follow me on socials and listen to the pod. The pod is where we get all the new things and just talk about them obsessively. Yeah. This one's good though. Like it's going to take a lot for me to say that something's better than this, even if it's got a fancy feature. Hmm. Any more questions in the room? A question. The Linktree one? Yeah. It's just Linktree Thesis Whisper. Actually, if, you, if you're on Instagram, it's linked in the top of my bio in Insta. Uh, questions online? Uh, I think that's mostly it. Thank you everyone online for your patience uh, yeah, yeah. and wealth of um, uh, suggestions and things. We'll make the chat and video recording available online. It is four o'clock now. Yeah. Um, so we should wrap up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so recording will be available. We'll put it on the Think Lab YouTube channel for a limited time, probably. Uh, we haven't figured out what yet, but we'll figure out a way to make sure all of this good sharing that's happened is accessible for everyone. And I think we can wrap up. Any, yeah. any closing thoughts, Inga? Have fun with it. Yeah. Really, I'm actually really serious in that. The more fun you find this sort of stuff, the more creative you're going to be with it and the less of a burden and an anxiety thing it will be. It is it's creative and fun. Thank you for your time. It's always enjoyable to be here in Cambridge. Love, 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 love teaching in Cambridge. Invite me back. Yes, we're, December, working, on we're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah. Um, rooms like you. this, it's just great. Thank Next you for being online. One, yeah, so, this yeah. is pretty fancy. I know, I'm kidding. There's yeah. like 16th century, 15th century paintings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See you online.